I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 35 of The Power of Bold. From New York City, it's The Power of Bold, the podcast on risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and bold living. Join us as we interview world-class performers, analyze life-changing books, and gather actionable insights to help you achieve your goals. Here's your host, Adam Pascarella. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this latest episode of the podcast. I hope everyone enjoyed Thanksgiving and is ready for the upcoming holiday season. In the intro to our last episode, I mentioned how excited I was about the upcoming Michigan-Ohio State football game. Now, if you follow college football or heard about the score, you'll see that I shouldn't have been so excited. So I'm thinking it's best to stay away from predictions or prognosticating about some of my favorite teams. All I'd say is, for Michigan fans out there, let's keep the faith. Anyway, on to this episode. I'm pleased to bring you my discussion with Dr. Nick Morgan. Nick is one of America's most prominent communications theorists and coaches. After suffering a skull fracture in a tobogganing accident when he was 17 years old, Nick began studying body language and communication. Now, companies and individuals work with Nick to obtain his unique insights on communication and body language. Nick has coached individuals about to give congressional testimony, prepared guests to appear on the Today Show, and is written for presidents and CEOs of Fortune 100 companies. Nick is also an author. He has written several books about communication, body language, and storytelling. Some of those titles include Give Your Speech, Change the World, How to Move Your Audience to Action, and Power Cues, The Subtle Science of Leading Groups, Persuading Others, and maximizing your personal impact. His most recent book is on digital communications, and it's called Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. As I said, Nick is a renowned communications expert. And because we frequently touch on or allude to digital communication in this podcast, I was extremely excited to chat with Nick. In our discussion, Nick and I touched on topics like why digital communication is devoid of emotion, why you're not alone in getting naturally distracted when attending a conference call or video chat, how we can use LinkedIn and online connections to our advantage, and how we can avoid common traps when sending emails to colleagues and clients. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Nick Morgan. Nick Morgan, thanks for appearing on The Power of Bold. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So, Nick, I'm excited to have you here because digital communication is something that really fascinates me. It's something that affects all of us, yet we may not know exactly how to avoid common mistakes or how to best leverage digital communication to our advantage. And upon reading your book, the first thing that came to mind is this thought. It was, wow, our digital selves are extremely rude. We're (laughs) we're harsh and egotistical. We lie more frequently than in the non-digital world. We betray people. We're essentially jerks. So let's start off with that. Would you agree somewhat with that characterization? (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That's an interesting case you're preparing for the uh, for the indictment <laughs> of online people, but uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, all those things are supported in the research that and and one you didn't mention, um, but which is implied, which is trolling. Um, that's a that's a phenomenon that that was incredibly rare in the face to face world if it existed, but has become a a, a, a terrible scourge online. So. Right and. Reading your book, it reminded me of this this bit by Louis C.K., the uh, the comedian who's <laughs> who's had some problems recently. But a couple years ago, he was on Conan O'Brien's show, and he was talking about online bullying. And he was saying that you know kids when they bully each other face to face, they get that emotional feedback that they don't get when they're in the digital world. And when they're bullying someone online, I think they, they don't get the, the body language and the, the subtle clues that you would get in, in a face to face interaction. So really your, what a part of your thesis is that these emotional cues, this body language is missing in online communication. Would you say that's fair? Yes, absolutely. The, the, 
the, and the further thing about that is that the, the way in which we get that face-to-face -face feedback that you're talking about, the, uh, if, if somebody says something mean to us and then we wince, the other person sees that wince, it actually goes deeper than most people realize. Uh, so when we think of a bully, we think, well, the bully is in an aggressive posture and we're the victim and, and therefore the bully is doing all the hurting and we're the ones getting hurt. But actually, the way people experience emotions is is surprisingly communal. We have these things called mirror neurons in our heads. And so when I feel pain, if I'm standing next to somebody else, they have a little pain neuron, literally, that fires in their head too. Now, we all know some people are more sensitive than others and a little more inured to other people's pain. But nonetheless, even that bully is going to feel uncomfortable uh, if he sees the, the wince in the other person's eye. He may still be a bully and he may still act on and still uh, uh, be cruel, but uh, at least he's feeling a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the online world, you don't get that feedback um, and so you don't feel it. As a result, we feel much more licensed to uh, just go ahead and, and, and say cruel things because we don't realize in a very direct and literal sense that we're, that we're uh, giving other people pain. Right. And so going back to that face to face communication, the bully says something mean, the victim winces, the bully feels that pain as well through the mirror neurons, like you said, but that's, they, they just put that aside, they repress that and they continue on. Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, that's basically what happens. Uh, one likes to think that the bully, therefore, is a little more miserable than when he started. Uh, and so uh, yeah. the, bull the bully's life is not a, a happy one either. But I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the, the effect. Of course, it's much worse for the victim th than, it is, than it is for the bully. But the point of that is that our, we share our emotions. I put it even more strongly. Uh, and I say we leak our emotions to each other. And we can't help doing that. That's the point. I mean, there is a tiny percentage, 1% of the population apparently, that's uh, uh, that's psychotic and doesn't uh, get other people's pain um, for some reason of misfiring of their, of their mirror neurons. But uh, we're talking about the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. And for listeners who haven't read your book yet, they may hear this discussion about emotions and the fact that we can't properly transmit emotions digitally, and they may respond thinking, well, if I'm on a video call with someone or if I'm Skyping with someone, I can physically see them, I can physically see, see their reaction to whatever I'm saying. And sure, it's, it's harder to tell on email or other text-based communications, but for those people that would maybe push back on what you're saying and say, hey, I can... I can gauge the emotions of another person digitally. How would you respond to that? You know, that's uh, really interesting. It turns out that video conferencing, uh, first of all, there are two things about it that, that are relevant uh, to this, this question. The first is that many fewer people use video conferencing than you might think. The number of people who routinely use uh, video conferencing in business is still quite small. Now, that's surprising given that it's a new technology. And to your point, yes, it certainly increases the amount of, of uh, emotional information you get to be able to see the other person's face. However, and here's the second uh, problem with video conferencing and the real one, um, it's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person. And something funny happens when we translate people into two dimensions. Um, our brains spend a lot of time doing something called proprioception, which is figuring out where we are in space and where other people are in space. And that's very important to us for obvious survival reasons. We've evolved to care a lot about where we are and where other people are for our own personal safety, if nothing else. Uh, and we want to know whether people are coming toward us or moving away from us. We're always more interested and more engaged and more involved with people who are moving toward us and the opposite, less engaged when they move away. Now, on a video conference, the unconscious mind can't tell how far away that two-dimensional representation mm -hmm. of the other person is. And so what happens is your brain puts in a huge amount of effort. Imagine the little wheel on your on your Mac if you, if you have Apple products that uh, when the computer is trying to do something and can't 
can't quite succeed. It's just whirring or the or the little uh, little hourglass on on Microsoft. Um, it's just whirring and not getting anywhere. That's your brain on a video conference. It's it's whirring and whirring, saying where is that person? How far away is that person? Why can't I tell? And so it uses up a fair amount of brain uh, wattage just trying to figure that out and not succeeding. So the first thing that happens with video conferencing is that it's tiring and disorienting for our brains, which distracts us. Um, and then, of course, the second part of that is uh, that uh, the the picture is usually fairly small. It may not be very well lit if you're looking, uh, say, uh, in a business setting at somebody who's in a conference room and there's several people sitting around a table. Some of those people can hardly see at all. So, mm-hmm. so you actually lose a fair amount of, of visual information that you would be easily getting if you were sitting in the same room. And so it's it's is highly imperfect, but the big deal, the, the real problem for your brain is this proprioception problem. You can't tell how far away the other person is. And so the brain is is constantly pinging the space saying, where is this other person? Where is is he or she? I can't tell. Um, and and getting hung up on that on that issue. And so this proprioception leads to distraction, disengagement, and frustration, right? And we just feel flustered by the process and we don't feel like much has been accomplished. I'm, I'm actually. But there's here. a fr- yes, there's a further problem too, and this has to do with uh, our evolutionary brains, and it's it's and it's important to state because it's a big reason for all the other kinds of problems that that we're talking about, and we'll get to uh, with online with virtual communication, and that is so. Imagine the brain as a prediction machine. It's it's uh, walking around with us trying to keep us alive. So it's predicting a few seconds, a minute or two into the future saying, is there danger around the next corner? Now it does that mostly through the five senses, the obvious ones that we all know about. And then the sixth sense that I've been talking about, proprioception, where it tries to figure out where everybody is in space uh, because of the the essential safety danger uh, issue of that. And when it doesn't get good information in any one of those channels, then what it does is it assumes the worst. It fills up that channel with the worst possible interpretation. And the, and the reason for that is, uh, and if you talk to neuroscientists, as I did in doing the research for the book, they will say, we humans are an anxious species. We've evolved that way, and that's a good thing. Anxiety is a good thing for us in that situation, because imagine we're walking through the forest. We're a fairly weak species. Um, we're victim to lions and tigers that can wipe us out with a single stroke of their paw. And so it's, it, it makes sense for us to assume there's a tiger around the next corner because then we'll go into a defensive crouch and be ready for it. And so back to uh, video conferencing, we're not getting quite as much information in several of the channels that we're used to getting. And so we fill it up with the worst possible interpretation. Oh, no, the other person on that line is very close to me and threatening. <laughs> yeah. And so and that's part of why the whole video conferencing experience is a little anxiety producing. It's really and then there's and, and sorry, there's just one other further point which I love in this. So the other really strange thing about video conferencing, and when I talk about this to audiences, they they get it immediately and say, Yeah, why didn't I think of that? So imagine sitting in a face to face conference and you're holding a little mirror and looking at it all the time. How weird would that be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what you do on a video conference because you've got that PIP, the picture in a picture, which shows you you. Yeah. And and when you track, there's there was a, a cute little bit of research that was done. It tracked the eye movements of people on video conferencing. And guess what they're doing more than <laughs> half themselves. the time? Yeah. They're looking at themselves. Now, how weird would that be in a face-to-face meeting if you sat there with holding this little mirror sort of just below your uh, uh, line of sight? And instead of looking at the other person across the table, you were constantly taking little peeks at yourself. How weird would that be? That's and yet that's what we do on a video conference. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I, I can totally see that happening. And it – Somewhat of a tangent here, but this discussion kind of leads me to um, ask about Facebook's new product, the Portal. I don't know if you've seen commercials for for I this have, uh, yeah. this device. Yeah. So if this sort of video conferencing leads us to assume the worst in people, it sounds like you're pretty bearish on that <laughs> on that product. Would you say that's right? Yeah, I don't think that's going to work. There were early, earlier video. Uh, 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 conferencing little machines like that they were designed for the home that didn't work now that they they were early days in, in in the era of less bandwidth so it may have been uh, people didn't didn't take to those just because there were a lot of technical problems so the technical problems are better now but i would say the the basic problem with uh with that whole uh facebook idea is um compounded now by 
the suspicion in the last year or so about Facebook and its its surveillance and about mm -hmm. data mining and that kind of thing. You add that on top of the sort of intrusive nature of this, and I would suspect that um, that there would be a, not much take up. It's interesting because one of the one of the promises of uh, online communication, specifically for retirees, was that it would be a good way for them to stay in touch with their family and loved ones and friends and whatnot without having to leave uh, the comfort of their easy chair. And if, of course, they were homebound in some way, this would be a great way to stay connected. And it's it turned out there was an interesting bit of research done. The more time that retirees spend um, on their mobile phones and in various online settings, um, emailing uh, and even uh, audio conferencing, um, the more likely they are to be depressed. Hmm. Now, that's exactly the opposite of the promise that it would make them feel better to be connected uh, to their family and friends. It turns out that kind of connection does them no good at all. In fact, it increases their likelihood of depression. You give them a little face-to-face -face time and they cheer right up. Right, and the reason it leads to depression is just the inherent nature of digital communication? That's right. And that, as I did the research, that, of course, was the first basic problem that I found. It it's something that we don't think about consciously precisely because when we get together face to face, most of our uh, communication is unconscious. It's our unconscious minds checking out the other person's winks and nods and smiles and, and movements and, and gestures. Uh, and we do that all at a tremendously fast, efficient rate, very unconsciously. So we know instantly how somebody else is feeling. Now, take that the richness of that conversation and put it in a text message or put it um, on a phone call and then even put it in a, in a video conference, as I was saying, and what you see is it's just diminished. There's not as much information getting through. Um, and, so, uh, and so as a result, instead of getting that emotional hit that we crave of, of uh, the, the richness and the warmth of a human-to-human -human interaction, what we get is a pale imitation of that. And, and so it frustrates us, uh, and it's like Facebook likes. You get a bit addicted to it. It gives you a tiny little endorphin rush or, 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 or serotonin hit or whatever it is, but, uh, but it's not enough to truly make you happy. And, and so you go back and constantly look for more. Right. Right, and so, or you, or you get depressed. Yeah, either one. <laughs> or both. <laughs> a bad, bad situation, nonetheless. Um, so you have this emotional part, which is a major problem of digital communications. But another major problem is just the immense distraction that is sometimes provided. And reading your book, it immediately brought me to visions of conference calls or, or again, video meetings that I've been on. So. It's not just me that that gets distracted, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure studies have been done on distracted employees or workers on conference calls. It has to be above 50, 60 percent. Is that right? Yeah, it's shocking. It's 80 percent, and yeah. that's that's what people will admit to. And when I've uh, been talking about this uh, book since the launch with uh, audiences, and I ask people to raise their hand, um, and immediately not a scientific uh, survey, but uh, an interesting anecdotal one, it's always 100% of, I'll say, how many people spend a fair amount of their work time on uh, audio conferences where you don't see the people face-to-face -face as a way of getting work done as part of a team. 100% of people raise their hand. And I say, now, time to be honest, how many of you immediately do something else when, you, when you're on that audio conference? And it's always 100%. And I'm astounded. <laughs> and I ask them, I, sometimes if I'm feeling combative, I'll say, so, why do you do that? I mean, you never do that face to face and, and people get very sheepish, but the basic reason and the basic answer they give me is they're bored. Mm -hmm. And then I am able to tell them why they're bored and they find that that fascinating. And the reason is that it turns out that audio conferences of the sort that most people have with computers and, and little boxes of sound or, or perhaps a headset or or worst of all is earbuds. What happens is the human voice, in order to go through that pipe um, and get to your ear, is condensed. And they condense it to the basic pitch at which we speak. But the human voice is enriched by what we call overtones and undertones, uh, sounds that you don't hear consciously, but that, are, that accompany the basic pitch at which you speak. And the, the further reason that you find audio conferences boring 
is that it turns out all the emotions are conveyed in the undertones. And so literally the, the, the sound that you hear on an audio conference is a human voice stripped of its emotional richness. Mm -hmm. And so it, by nature, it's, it's boring. You don't get the info. And, and when we're talking about emotion here, it's important to understand that we're talking about emotion in the full sense. So we want to know, is somebody on our side or not in the business setting? Is somebody else getting excited about this project or not? Can I count on his or her support? It's those kind of questions. It's not just emotion like friendliness or, or anger. It's, it's sort of all the nuances of the business world uh, where we need to know who's on what team and who's helping us and who isn't and who's enthusiastic about the project and who's willing to stay late and work on it and get it done and who isn't. All those kind of subtleties which you would just easily pick up in a face-to-face -face conference are missing um, on the audio conference. Sure, and and so I, I'm assuming the reason that companies continue to do this, I'm, I'm sure they recognize the downfalls or flaws of them, but they do it because it's perhaps the cheapest option or there's no alternative. I, I know you work with companies um, frequently. Would you say that's that's accurate? Oh, it's absolutely driven by cost. Absolutely yeah. no question. And the surprising thing is most people are not aware of the audio compression. That's just something that's never thought they've never thought about uh, because they're not consciously aware of it. So even even companies that drive a huge amount of their business through audio conferencing uh, virtual teams um, are not aware of that. Um, but it, the primary factor there is simply cost. Yeah, absolutely. you'd even think... Uh a company that really relies on phone customer support would recognize that and, <laughs> and figure out another way, but alas, we're, we're stuck with this. Um, and I recommend people check out that part of the book. I found it fascinating, the, the science and research behind it, uh, as far as audio and your, your tone of voice. Um, so from here, I'd like to kind of move on to common situations that uh, we can face in our professional lives and how to improve them as far as digital communications. Um, and I'd first like to start with starting relationships or connecting online. I'm sure you can relate to this, but I can't tell you how many times that I or the listeners receive unsolicited LinkedIn messages that are clearly mass emails in order to connect. These people always talk about synergies. They always use that specific <laughs> word. And it's clear that these sort of connection requests are really only for the person initiating the request. The value is only for them. There's really no mutual value. And so obviously digital connections or starting relationships online are more fragile than face-to-face -face meetings. Um, I guess let's start there. Can you explain why they're more fragile than those face-to-face -face meetings? Yeah, absolutely. I can explain it best with a little anecdote that happened to me. Um, I had uh, through a mutual connection, I was given a lead to a potential client, and we agreed to set up um, a Skype call, uh, a video Skype call, to begin the conversation. And for various reasons, I had got the time wrong. I was off by 15 minutes in my calendar, uh, which is now, thanks to the virtual world, done in 15-minute blocks. Uh, and right. and. Uh, and also, when I realized it, so I signed on a few minutes late because I got a ping from the from the other gentleman, the potential uh, client, saying, "Where are you?" And when I signed on, then we had a series of Skype problems to get the video conferencing going. Um, we had to exchange each other's names. Uh, we hadn't we had neglected to do that, and then the video, of course, as Skype often does, froze up. And so by the time we actually got communicating, we were probably 15 minutes late, and I was flustered. And this potential clients certainly got the impression of me as a technological incompetent and mm -hmm. and I wanted to say to him no 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 that's not me I'm usually I'm I, I love my technology I'm usually pretty good with it this doesn't happen very often this is not me you're getting the wrong impression but of course that's not persuasive at all now had we had and I couldn't say that it was just it's not appropriate and and had we been having a face to face meeting and I was running a little bit late and maybe I had trouble finding the coffee shop that we were meeting in or the restaurant I could have rushed in all apologetic and and my with extra effort with my personal presence, I could have made up the the difference and 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 established that mutual trust that comes when you have a face to face connection. Online, it's much more fragile, as you suggested. And there's a further thing because we don't know how to trust somebody online, and because that potential trust is more fragile, we use a, a mental shortcut to test for trust. And this is really important to understand. And that mental 
shortcut is consistency. Mm -hmm. And so we hold people to this absolute standard of consistency online. So here this, back to the anecdote, our uh, potential client was trying to connect with me. Um, and one of the things we were talking about was video coaching. So clearly uh, virtual uh, technology was important to our relationship. And the inconsistency there was that I was putting myself forward as somebody who could do business with him virtually, and yet I appeared to be virtually incompetent. And so there was an inconsistency there, which he simply couldn't get over, even if he knew logically that it was just a series of, of minor mishaps and probably wouldn't happen all the time. Sure. And then from and, that, that point, it, it, I'm assuming it took a while to repair that, uh, that I guess, broken trust isn't the right word, but repair that image that he had of you. Yes. the, the that, uh, And in fact, it didn't. He didn't become a client. I lost okay. the business because it, there was, and that's my point, that online in a virtual uh, relationship, once that trust uh, or that uh, effort to set up trust is broken or disrupted, then it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to re-establish it. And yet when you th so consistency is the issue. And yet when you think about it, we humans are not consistent. To be human <laughs> means to be inconsistent. We have good days and bad days. Sure. And so we're holding the online world to an impossible standard. We're holding each other to an impossible standard. And we don't even hold that standard to ourselves uh, because I was forgiving myself like mad as I was talking to him. I was saying to myself all the things that I wanted to say to this potential client in person, which is, hey, I'm really a technologically pretty able guy. This is just a bad day. Cut me some slack doesn't happen online and that's the difference and and in, in the book I, I talk about the, the the online golden rule we really shouldn't do that but that's our shortcut and we do mm hmm and so clearly creating that first impression in the face-to-face -face world gives you a larger margin of error just in case something like that happens but but say say a listener is maybe trying to transition into a new field mm. um, whether that's you know getting a job at another company corporation or is trying to perhaps become an entrepreneur and they're thinking of using linkedin or some professional network as one strategy to meet people in the new field how would you best recommend that they go about doing that yeah so the first thing you need to think about is is that consistency you need to figure out what is my uh, implicit promise of my new venture or my new set of business relationships and how can i make sure that promise is absolutely consistently carried out through everything we do that's the first thing and then the second thing is you want to establish um, a stronger tie than just as you uh, very accurately described that kind of um, bland um, uh, universal uh, pseudo Facebook uh, automated message kind of relationship, which isn't really anything about the other person. So you want to show you've done your homework. Uh, and so you don't reach out to somebody until you're ready to make it more personalized than that, than that mass uh, form of message. And the reason for that is when you think about, say, world leaders getting together to try to uh, negotiate a, a treaty or something like that, how do they always begin? They always begin with a meeting which has a, a meal involved. They always have dinner dinner together and they make a big deal about their, their place and their local dishes and, and this kind of thing. And the reason for that is we humans begin to trust people when we see them in other, other settings and, and not just the the, the business ones, because we, we want to feel like we know that person. And so I want to know in a business setting how you're going to behave when – we're up to against the deadline and I need you to get something done for me um, and the push comes to shove. How are you going to behave? And so if I've seen you in other settings and you've shown yourself to be, pardon me, to be cool in a crisis or, uh, or, you've, or you've shown yourself to have a sense of humor under some duress or uh, I've seen you just in a few settings, then I'm going to make a stronger connection with you um, than if I've just seen that single one-way business message. And, and so you want to think about as the next step is how can I make that connection richer mm. than just the basic business one? So first of all, it's got to be consistent. Second, you've got to figure out ways to make it richer. And then third, if at all possible, if there's going to be any length to the relationship or any importance to it, try to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and then the other thing is as you establish your network, um, and you're going to get referrals from your network, then make sure that the important nodes in your network are strong uh, 
uh, relationships that have a face-to-face -face, uh, connection because nobody's going to go to bat for you um, just on the basis of a thin virtual connection. Uh, what you need are, are certainly in those nodes of people who are going to uh, speak up for you or provide references or introduce you to potential third parties, that kind of thing. Then you want those to be very strong face-to-face -face connections. So it's worth investing in, in those just to make sure that that's uh, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. When making those face-to-face -face connections, you mentioned world leaders gathering together and breaking bread, so to speak. Do you think there's yeah. some significant or extra power in meeting over a meal or even coffee compared to, to something else when, when building on to that, that uh, early connection? Absolutely. We humans live to eat and eat to live. So, um, we can't go out without food for very long, and food is very emotional for us. So there are two things that um, that humans particularly respond to um, in in early settings, and one of them is food in early stages of relationship, and the other is music. And and since it's harder in a business relationship to to introduce music in some natural way <laughs> into the setting, I don't know. Maybe you could come in with rock and roll blasting, which would either get the deal or, or kill it instantly, <laughs> depending on your taste in rock and roll. Um, the, the, the it's a little harder to see how music fits in. So I would say yes, always go for the meal if you can. Uh, go for the coffee, um, and it's just it's now with thanks to uh, the widespread use of cafes as a as a standard place for for uh, doing business, it's become a very natural thing. Um, and, but it's the, it's really the emotional connection that food provides. Definitely. It's really interesting. And so from those online LinkedIn connections, I'd like to also speak about email. It, it takes up a large part of your book or text-based communication. It runs our life. It's not going away anytime soon. So what are, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people making with professional emails? Email is a is a is a beautiful thing. The promise originally to us was that uh, that we would get two benefits. First of all, that email would be frictionless in Silicon Valley speak, uh, which means it would be very easy to do and basically free. Um, and so the friction of having to put something in an envelope and licking the envelope and sealing it and putting on a stamp and walking it to the post office, all that friction was going to go away. And then the other thing was, and people sort of forgotten about this, it was called asynchronous. Um, that was the benefit. And asynchronousness was the idea that I could send you an email at 6 o'clock one evening as I was wrapping up my day of work, and you could read it the following morning at 9 o'clock over your coffee. Uh, those were the days. Um, and what we've got instead, um, two unintended consequences, was we got buried in email, and, mm -hmm. of course, it became 24-7. Now, it turns out that most people use email for their to-do list. So the first big problem with email is we get far too much of it. We're trying to handle it 24-7, um, um, and it's our to-do list, and so we get anxious uh, when it rises above whatever our internal number is. I was talking to someone the other day who said, yeah, uh, hers was 50. Mm. When she gets more than 50 emails, she starts to freak out. So between 50 and 100, it's like stressful. And over 100, um, she's just got to focus on that to get the number down. And But the implication behind all of this is, and this is the real problem with email these days, is that in order to keep up with it all, we've become skimmers. Right. And we do two things with that. We, we ourselves write shorter and shorter emails, and we read other people's emails less and less carefully. And when you add those two things together, you get this rather shocking failure rate of email, which is 62%. Mm. And by failure, we mean it's misunderstood one way or other. You didn't mean what you say, and the other person didn't understand what you meant. Mm. Um, and we've all had the experience, of course, of saying something witty in an email and having the other person be offended. Why? Because they're stupid and didn't get the joke. Right? <laughs> uh, how, exactly. uh, what other explanation is there? Uh -huh. But uh, – <laughs> Could it be that, that we wrote it too fast and, and the joke wasn't very well done? Maybe. We, but um, we tend to blame the other person. But that's the nature of email. Over 60% of the time, it's misunderstood. Now, think about that as a communication method. And, and think about um, that um, the higher up, another bit of research shows, the higher up you go in an organization, the shorter your emails become, which means the more likely they are to be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And so you add all that up and you realize email is a very imperfect medium and yet and, and all the other um, slack and text messaging and, and so on that 
go with it, um, um, including all those together because they all have the same kind of problems. Um, and so you have to use email with great care. Um, and um, we can get into the solutions um, uh, sure. n now or, or we can hold those because uh, you mentioned you wanted to start talking about that. But that's the, that's the real issue with email. It's just that people have to remember um, it, we do not – um, let out uh, glad cries when we see another email um, <laughs> these days. We just think, oh my God, I've got to read that thing and move it quickly to some other category and, and move on to the next email because my to-do list is growing and growing. Yeah, it's funny. In the 1990s when email was, was first starting, people would get excited to receive an email, even if it was a promotional email from a store or retailer. And yeah, nowadays right. it's the uh, the complete opposite. And going back to this point about clarity, it's obviously important, but I would like to talk about the solutions. What does that mean in practice? Does that mean you know, sending along drafts to people to look over your work? Per perhaps that's colleagues when you're emailing a client or a customer. What, what exactly does that mean, especially considering that we're so busy and distracted these days? Well, to go back to your example, yes, of people who are using email um, and or LinkedIn or or communications via via various other channels to uh, to promote their business or to develop a business, then it's extremely important that at least your emails not be understood, uh, misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry. And as a result, what you do is draft the email and then read it aloud to um, anybody who listen, just yourself if you're alone in a, in a cubicle, uh, and try it with different tones of voice to see if it could be misunderstood. One of the great problems of short emails is people often assume a, um, a sarcastic or a terse or angry tone. And remember, that's because it's to our evolutionary advantage, back to the tigers and the walking through the jungle, to assume the worst. So if, we don't, if we're not getting a clear intent from the email, we're going to assume that it's negative. Mm. Even and if so it's you, from a colleague you trust? Even if from a colleague you trust. Huh. And it's, it's astounding. As I say, that happens more than 60% of the time. And so you get that email. I'm sure most of your listeners can put your, themselves in this situation. You get that email from the boss, and, and it says, nice going. Yeah. Do you interpret <laughs> that as nice going with a happy face or nice going with a touch of sarcasm? <laughs> yeah, and then and, honestly, the, the listener or I would think about that for the next 30 or 60 minutes, trying to get in the head of the boss and thinking, oh, should I have done this or that? And <laughs> it adds exactly. to lack of yeah. productivity. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And and it can cause real a dis, uh, a disaffection from the company over time as those little, what feels like little hurts, uh, little slings and arrows start to build up. So the first thing to do is to read it over several different ways to make sure that it, it sounds clear at least to you. The second thing to do, and this is something I hold myself to um, uh, and don't always succeed, but it, it works really, really well. And this came from a bit of research uh, with uh, with a specific uh, population uh, of people who were having trouble focusing on emails. Um, if you put in the header a complete sentence that tells the other person what they're going to get out of it, hmm. then the likelihood that they'll understand it, open it, understand it, and act on it is much higher. And so instead of doing that quick question heading, and I've done that, I'm sure all of your listeners have done that a million times, or... Uh, or one second, or something. Just a just a couple of words in the in the um, in the heading. Say something like, "I'd love to ask uh, you a question about your business," or um, "Here's an idea for you that you might not have thought of," or something like that. And you want to avoid, for some reason, I think examples I'm thinking of sound like uh, uh, online clickbait. But maybe that's because I I see too many of those headlines. <laughs> so you, you <laughs> don't make it too don't make it sound too clickbaity. <laughs> Uh, sure. You'll find the next paragraph amazing. No, don't do that. <laughs> I uh, don't do five thousand dollars by doing this. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, make it make it real. Uh, uh, my examples were at fault there, not the concept. Uh, make it real, but let the person know what's in it for them uh, in the in the headline, and and that will increase the chance that that they read it uh, correctly, and as I say, that they open it and act on it. That's great advice. What do you think about some emails that start with? perhaps action required in all caps to get uh, the recipient's attention. Is that an effective way to, to get recipients to open your email? Or pay uh, well, it, 
Yeah, I uh, I was talking with a neuroscientist about the effect of email, and and we were we were uh, saying that email has been in existence since the early 1970s, uh, where it was first started in a couple of uh, universities and um, with the uh, uh, with the military uh, researchers um, in order to send uh, bits of data back and forth. Um, so we've had it for since the 70s. So that's about 40, 50 years that we've had email. And he said, we've learned one thing in 50 years. All caps mean shouting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so the answer to that question is no. Never use all caps because it just looks immediately the other person like you're shouting at them. And who wants to be shouted at as an initial, uh, <laughs> yeah. a, a, a initial re, uh, connection? Right, right. Just yeah, I've I've had experiences in the business world where that's or I've received those emails and it actually made me open them I think to a, a greater extent than other emails. But yeah, if if it's in all caps, um, I'm not sure that's. It seems like they're shouting at you, and I'm sure the research yeah. backs up that it's not that effective. Um, no. If if we can move on from email, just to talk about one larger topic here, and that's online branding. And yeah. I, I guess I wasn't expecting this chapter when I first opened the book, but I thought it was extremely valuable for, for me and my, my listeners. Um, you really talk about taking ownership over your image and brand online. We can spend an entire episode talking about this, but, um, can you, to start off, can you speak about why it's so important, um, just to take control over your, your online presence? It's, I, I guess the answer is pretty obvious, but, but in practice, what have you what have you seen, and why is it so important? Yeah, it's a, it's astounding to me how little people think about this. Maybe they know they should, but they tend not to do it. And the reason, of course, is that the virtual world, the online world, is built for machines by machines. And the the thing about machines is they're not human, and they remember forever. We humans remember are inconsistent and our memories are faulty. And that's a good thing for most of us <laughs> because mm. it means our friends forgive us for the things that we, uh, we do wrong or the omissions, the things we forget to do. We forget to acknowledge their birthday or something. Machines never make that mistake. But that also means that every single scrap of information about you and people who have the same name as you um, who might be under indictment or uh, under uh, – warrant or whatever in 50 others in 45 of the other 50 states um, and no fault to you you're going to show up as somebody who looks like a criminal or at sure. least somebody with the same name as a criminal but beyond that even if it's even if it's true stuff about you it's a motley collection of whatever the machines have collected and that um, when you look at it turns out to be a bizarre hodgepodge of information and compare it in your mind to the face-to-face -face impression. Let's say you were going to make a connection um, with somebody for the first time. You're meeting at the coffee shop we talked about earlier. Now, do you go in your pajamas? If you're a guy, do you neglect to shave? Uh, do you forget to do your hair? No, of course not. You, you, you have a public image to maintain, and it's one that's, we're going to assume, reasonably tidy. Um, and and so you, you put a little work into it. You get yourself dressed up and cleaned up, and off you go. Hmm. And yet most of us, because the thing to understand is now everybody who's going to meet you for the first time virtually one way or another, whether it's as a potential client or a potential um, uh, supplier or whatever, um, potential hiree, is going to Google you. And so what they're going to see is not that tidy impression of you when you dressed up and put on your best bib and tucker, but they're going to see the hodgepodge. And so it's as if you showed up in your pajamas to that face-to-face -face meeting, yeah, warts and all. And I mean that, that's absurd. You would never do that. And yet most of us let our online presence just go like that and just sort of take what comes. And and here's the thing about it: because machines never forget, it's very difficult um, to eliminate any information that's out there already online. And so you have to take another tack. And this is what I talk about in the chapter: uh, you have to decide what it is your positive persona is going to be. This is the cleaned up version of yourself that you would take to that job interview face to face um, and put that out online so that it drowns out the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the key is to get it to page two of the Google uh, search, yeah. right? Because most people just look at page one. So if you've got good information out there about, and I don't, I don't mean to say this in a, in a, um, 
in a mean way or uh, implying that you've really got nasty things to hide. It's not that so much. It's just a mess, and it's not clear. And when somebody Googles you, th they feel good if what they find is sort of clear information, a couple of, of crisp um, online images and, and a bit of data about you. You've got a LinkedIn profile that looks up to date and has lots of information in it. Maybe you've got a Twitter feed. Maybe you've got a blog. Maybe you've got a, 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 even a website. Hmm. And all those things look consistent. They're, they're, they tell the same story one to another. And when you have that, then you look like that person who's put on a nice shirt and jacket and gone to the meeting as opposed to somebody who showed up in their pajamas. And that's the difference. Unless you take charge of it, it isn't going to happen online. Sure. For the, for the listener that is working at their corporate job and maybe wants to become an entrepreneur like we alluded to, perhaps in a different field or sector than they're currently in, you would recommend from there that they perhaps blog about whatever – sector they want to uh, be a part of to kind of build up their online reputation in that in that sphere maybe perhaps Ab creating their own website that sort of thing absolutely yeah. uh, you need to create a positive image if you're passionate about it so much the better it'll it should be easier for you start writing about it start uh, doing um, youtube videos about it whatever whatever feels like the best appropriate um, form uh, channel. The channel itself isn't as important as as starting to send a consistent message out there with a with a clear point of view about the field that you're trying to get into or that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other mistake not to make, by the way, that the reason I underline passion is that um, we often have the case uh, googling people and we see a web, let's say they've got a website and they've got one blog there and that blog was from a year and a half ago. Yeah, and there one blog post, and there hasn't been any posting since. What do we conclude from that? Well, that's again like showing up in your pajamas. They started something and they didn't finish it, um, and so that sends out a message that isn't very um, good to connect with your impression you're trying to convey when you show up for, say, a job interview. Of, I, I start what I, what I f start, I finish, and I'm a, I get my work done, and I'm a I'm a competent person. Uh, so don't start a, a blog that you can't keep up. Right, and, it's better and not to do it then. Yeah. Yeah, it would be better not to do it. And, and I'm not recommending, as, as your listeners will appreciate, I'm not recommending you don't do it at all. But I'm saying even worse is to is to do a half-ass job. Right. That's great. It, two, just two more quick questions here. So you, we talked about the problems with digital communications, the distraction, emotional element. You've been involved or at least have studied some of the new technology coming out that can perhaps improve our digital communications experience, what are you most excited about in the next 10 or 20 years? Well, I, this may sound a little science fiction-y to uh, your listeners, but I'm actually excited about uh, holograms um, mm. because the hologram solves the problem that I was talking about, the two-dimensional problem, because a hologram looks three-dimensional. And so it may be able to trick our brain into thinking the other person's actually present or re to respond to them as if um, we could tell where they were in space, so the proprioception problem goes away. I was talking to a friend of mine, a, a former client, who uh, who was all excited. He called me up and said, Nick, when I said, how are things going? He says, they're going great. I just gave, from my office in Boston, I just gave a speech in Singapore. And I said, oh, did you do it over a video conference? How was that? He said, no, 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 no. I did it as a hologram. Huh. And, and to my knowledge, that's the first one and and the Japanese are very advanced in terms of their technology, and so I'm not surprised that, that, that they would be the um, uh, and the Chinese and the and the, and the Singaporeans uh, especially are are very advanced. So I'm not surprised that the first hologram, the first successful speaking hologram, uh, would be in Asia, um, as seems to be the case. I haven't heard of any other examples, but it suggests a way forward that's probably going to improve our. Um, our virtual communications once we have the bandwidth and, and then the rest of it is up to us is to uh, uh, is as I and I talk about many many ways to improve the humanity of virtual communications um, so it's not just of machines by machines for machines but it's for humans and it, we have to start learning a new language we have to start um, speaking our emotional intent to other people because when we meet face to face we can assume that they're getting our emotional intent from our body language. Online, the emotional intent doesn't come through as easily, and so we have to supply it. And that's really the big change that I'm calling for in the book. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I always ask my guests one step or one action that listeners can take to better implement 
the insights that um, I guess share in each episode. And so if I were to ask you that same question, you would argue what you just said, maybe that we need to be, you know, convey our emotions more in digital communications. Is that right? Or what's your biggest takeaway for our one, listeners? One question, ask yourself, how did what I just say make you feel, make the other person feel? If you don't know the answer to that, then ask it out loud. And it has the nice effect, first of all, you may find out how the other person feels, which would be a good thing, uh, because otherwise you won't know as clearly. And then second, you're showing them the respect of taking the time and giving them the uh, place uh, to tell you that. And that shows a wonderful kind of caring attitude. And remember, so often the online experience is negative. Because the emotions don't come through, we assume the worst. This is a way of putting a positive spin back in, a positive emotional connection back in. So one question, ask yourself, how did what I just say make you feel? That's great. I'm going to start doing that <laughs> right away here. Well, well, Nick, this has been a terrific discussion about our, you know, our new communication reality and how we can avoid some of the, the common traps that we encounter. The book, again, is called Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. And if listeners would like to learn more about you or the work that you do, where can they go? Yes, please go to uh, publicwords.com, www.publicwords.com, which is our website. There's a contact form there. Info at Public Words is the email. You can re reply. We try to get to everybody in 24 hours. Uh, and uh, there's lots and lots of in information there about our coaching and 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 uh, books and and unfortunately for me an awful lot of uh, free material on there so uh, <laughs> your listeners can get lots of advice for free <laughs> well excellent we'll uh, post that link in the show notes and uh thanks again nick this was a great discussion thanks adam it was great to chat with you thanks again to my guest nick morgan a communications expert and author of the newly released book can you hear me how to connect with people in a virtual world Nick has a lot of lessons that we can implement in our daily lives. Whether we are thinking of leaving our job to start a business, or are simply content in our jobs and looking to become better communicators. If you're interested in learning more, I'd recommend that you check out the book, or at the very least, take advantage of the resources that Nick mentioned at the end of the podcast. All of this will be in the show notes, so head to our website to learn more. That's it for this episode of The Power of Bold. Don't forget you can find show notes and a transcript of this episode by visiting our website. And as always, thanks for leaving us a review on iTunes and Google Podcasts. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Power of Bold. For show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. Feel free to get in touch by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We'll see you next time.